Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is a special one hour presentation hosted by Alzheimer's Orange County. My name is Aroxy Kirikosian. I will be your host for today. And I'd also like to introduce you to my co host, Melissa. She will be monitoring the chat box that we have. So if you have questions regarding technology or the curriculum, please go ahead and type your questions in the chat box and we will do our best to respond. So I think it's a good time to get started. This presentation is titled How to Keep Your Brain Healthy and Lower Risk of Cognitive Decline. And this is a healthy brain presentation under our Healthy Brain Initiative at Alzheimer's Orange County. And we have a menu, a collection of healthy brain programs, memory training programs, uh, memory screenings that we conduct. I'd be happy to talk about that at the end of the presentation. But, but bef before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Irvine Clinical Research. They're a clinical, medical clinical um, independent company here in the city of Irvine, and they provide all kinds of um, clinical trials, cl clinical studies for participants and sponsors, and all kinds of interesting experimental drugs. So if you are interested in finding out what they do, I highly encourage you to visit their website, irvineclinical.com to find out who they are and what they do. So thank you so much Irvine Clinical Research for sponsoring this presentation. I'd like to keep this presentation interactive. So um, sometimes I post questions and I ask for your feedback and responses. Please feel free to type it in the chat box. It's always a lot of fun when we have uh, students engaged. So a little bit about this program, how to keep your brain healthy, lower risk of cognitive decline. We have uh, conducted some extensive research and we have uh, collected a lot of evidence-based information from World Health Organization, Centers for Disease Control, and National Institute of Health and Aging. And we are here presenting this information to you with some goals. So let's go over the goals right now. Understand age-related changes in memory, thinking, and learning. Uh, we are going to identify the six pillars of brain health, review possible risks and threats to brain health, learn what you can do to protect your brain health, and ultimately lower your risk for cognitive decline. Also, when we have time at the end, we'll go ahead and create our goals or learn how to create our own goals for healthy brain. So I want you to think about aging and what that means to you. And I'd like to pose a question to all of you. So in the 1900s, the average life expectancy was 49. Can you guess what the average life expectancy is today? So although we are living longer, are we living healthier? Not necessarily because 61% of Americans age 65 and older have multiple chronic health conditions. Thus, it is very critical for us to practice healthy aging. So I'd like to see some of your responses. What do you think is the average life expectancy today? So I see Robert from California Phones. He says 70, close. Lynn says 75 to 80. That's right, so it's about 80. And if we want to live to an exceptionally old age, we're probably interested in more than the extra years, right? We want to enjoy those extra years with a good bill of health, with good physical health and a sharp mind. And actually research shows us that we're capable of living a lot longer than that. We're capable of living to 115, right? But that's all dependent on a number of factors. And we'll talk about what those factors are and how we can practice healthy aging. So Sandra, she has very specific men, 78, woman, 82. Okay, very good. So what does aging mean to you? We often see different um, assumptions when it comes to media portrayal of elderly people versus what older adults actually are like. We see a lot of differences. So when it comes to media portrayal, we often see these pervasive assumptions or misconceptions that older adults are frail, vulnerable, sick, right? That's, that's all wrong and that is not contributing to anything productive when it comes to policy and public health. Those are actually hindering good public policy and um, public health efforts. So we want to debunk 
debunk all kinds of myths, debunk all stereotypes, because older adults are actually very active, are very happy, and they lead very healthy lifestyles. For example, like Ida Killing, she is a runner and she set a world record at the age of 92. And she became the first woman in history to run the 100 meter dash at the age of 100. Now that's incredible. And that's the type of healthy aging that we want to aspire to. So what is aging? We talk about aging. Um, what does it actually mean? Is there a definition? What do you think of when you think of aging? So that's what the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging sought to answer, this question of what is aging. So it began in 1958 when the study of gerontology, which is the study of aging, was very much in its infancy. So they followed um, individuals over a period of 50, 60 years, and they came down to two major conclusions when we think of aging. So changes that occur with aging do not inevitably lead to diseases, such as dementia. A number of disorders that typically occur in old age are a result of the disease process itself, not normal aging. So in simpler terms, aging does not equate to disease. And there's a great quote by the World Health Organization that although age is the biggest risk factor for developing cognitive decline, Dementia and Alzheimer's disease is not a natural or normal part of aging. So dementia is not a normal part of aging. And once we can grasp that, once we can debunk that major misconception, we can look at healthy brain research. And number two, we all age differently. Now this is critical too, because we tend to compare ourselves to our peers and our friends. There's no single chronological timetable for human aging. It does not exist. We all age differently. And that's related to a variety of different factors that we'll discuss shortly. Um, in fact, there's a lot of differences among older adults in terms of change and development than among younger adults, which is very fascinating. So aging and health. Aging well depends on your lifestyle, your environment, and your genes. So what do we mean by lifestyle? Lifestyle is your everyday activities. Lifestyle is your opinions, your values, your morals. It basically shapes who you are. And your environment is, of course, everything that is around you. This is including the people, the things, and also the infrastructure, the policies, the communities, genes. This is interesting because although there's certain genes that are associated with longevity, there is a study called the Danish Twin Study, and it actually revealed that a very small fraction of longevity is actually hard-coded into our genes. This is really good news because it shows us that we are in control of our brain health. And there are things that we can do to lead a healthy lifestyle, to practice healthy aging, and to ultimately contribute to a healthier version of us. So aging well depends on these three things. And research is continuously being done in three of these areas by National Institute on Aging, National Institute on Health, to um, better understand how these factors interact among each other. Healthy lifestyle choices may help to maintain a healthy body, healthy brain, and it may help to reduce the risk for cognitive decline. And we know what's good for your heart is good for your brain. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about age-related changes in learning and memory. Our brains age just like the rest of our bodies, unfortunately. It may shrink in size, slow down in speed, and it may become less adaptable to change. So it's not uncommon for us to notice changes when it comes to learning and memory. Some of these common changes are increased difficulty finding words. And this is that phenomenon we call tip of the tongue. When you feel like the word is on the tip of your tongue, if only someone can give you a clue, a hint, you almost got it. And the worst part about this feeling is that retrieval is imminent. You almost got it. This is very common. Young adults experience it about as often as once a week. Now, I want you to guess, how often do adults experience it, older adults, how often? Let me know in the chat box. I'm very curious to see what your guesses are. 
Also, you may notice more problems in multitasking. Multitasking is actually very bad for our brains. Our brains are not designed to multitask. And this is kind of scary news for us because multitask is the majority of us, right? This is our lives. When we multitask, we are rapidly switching our focus, uh, our attention from one activity to another. And to a certain extent, we dissociate. So when you actually think about it, what does it mean to multitask? It means to divide your attention in half. And when you do that, you're not giving your full undivided attention to one task. You're going back and forth. And that can be very detrimental to your brain. So some of the guesses I see, Robert says 20 times a week. <laughs> Lynn says, often, sometimes daily. Yes, so it is very common for older adults to experience it as often as once a day. So if you are experiencing it very often, maybe it's time to check in with yourself about what you're feeling, what you're going through, because it can be a sign of an underlying condition. You may also notice mild decreases in ability to pay attention. This is important. Uh, this is common because recall is also slower with age. So it's not surprising that we see changes in the ability to pay attention. We may see changes in uh, concentration and focus. This is common. And often older adults notice changes in their short-term memory. This is often because the first step in creating a memory is paying attention. And if you can't pay attention, you can't encode memories and you can't retrieve those memories. So all of these things work together. There's good news, right? If you're listening to this and you're thinking, that's me, I have tip of the tongue, I have problems multitasking, I have a lack of ability to pay attention, you're not alone. The good news is you can still learn new things, you can still create new memories, and you can improve vocabulary and language skills. So up until about two decades ago, it was believed that our brains can't create new cells. Actually, our brains change throughout our lifetimes. Our brains can make new connections, new cells, and it can improve memory, language skills, but that is through healthy practices. That is through memory training, and that is through being proactive. And uh, we will learn what some of those best practices are today. So it's important to talk about some potentially reversible causes of memory loss. Just because you are experiencing changes in your memory and cognition, it does not mean that it's due to cognitive decline or it's due to dementia or a specific disease like Alzheimer's disease. Most of the time, it's due to conditions that are actually treatable. For example, poor nutrition and dehydration. This is very common because if you have some sort of imbalance in your body chemistry, we also call this T and toast syndrome, where there's malnourishment. You're not getting enough nutrients and vitamins into your body. That can contribute to cognitive decline. So it's very important to be mindful of what you are putting into your body. Thyroid deficiency, right? Thyroid problems are common. That can be easily checked by a primary care physician, it can, it can be um, remedied by appropriate medications. Also medications, whether that's medication toxicity uh, or taking too many medications or certain medication combinations, right? Too much medication into the blood, uh, it can accumulate and can cause um, toxic reactions. Some medications taken together can cause bad reactions. Um, so it's very important to be mindful of what you are taking. And if you're not sure if the medications are right for you, those all should be taken back to your primary care physician for discussion. Depression. Depression is one of those common um, conditions that can cause changes in memory and cognition because um, extended periods of confusion, sadness, withdrawal, those are all things that can have a detrimental effect on your brain health and your memory health. So it's important to seek treatment. Sleep deprivation. We'll talk a, a bit more detail about this, but sleep apnea, not getting enough sleep, insufficient blood flow, oxygen flow to the brain, that can also be um, harmful for your brain. Not paying enough attention or distractions. We talked about this earlier. The first step in paying attention, uh, the, the first step in creating a memory is paying attention. And we see this a lot with people who come into Alzheimer's Orange County for a memory screening. 
oftentimes we see that it's not a memory problem, it's a paying attention problem. So we really try to um, identify the underlying condition. So let's talk about the six pillars of brain health. How can we love our brain? This is specifically straight from the Cleveland Clinic, all evidence-based. These are six things that we can do to contribute to a healthy brain, healthy heart, a healthier version of ourselves. And it's not any of these six things, it's a collection of all these things that we do together. And there's a lot of extensive research from all different institutions that show improvement in all of these areas will impact, will in fact um, improve uh, mood, will improve um, quality of life, and ultimately lead to healthier, happier version of ourselves. So this is diet and nutrition, exercise and physical health, cognitive activity or cognitive stimulation, also medical health, sleep and relaxation, and social engagement. So first, let's talk about diet. This is important because most of us have improvement in this area. So unfortunately, this is what the average American diet looks like, where it's a lot of added fats and sugars and a lot of meat poultry and fish. And there was a 2010 study from the National Cancer uh, Institute that showed three out of four Americans don't eat a single piece of fruit in a day. That's scary and that's very unfortunate because we know how important fruits and vegetables are. And nine out of 10 Americans don't meet the minimum daily recommended intake of vegetables. So there is room for improvement for all of us, especially during this pandemic when we tend to rely more on comfort foods and those tend to be uh, foods that are not so good for us. So what should be on your plate? What should your plate look like? So we want you to fill half of your plate with veggies and fruits. And I want you to aim for color and variety and I want you to be creative. Try new things. Try things that you haven't really tried before because you might find that you know there are foods that you really enjoy that you haven't really tried and a quarter of your plate, you should pack it with protein. And there's all kinds of versatile sources for protein, like fish, poultry, beans, nuts, not necessarily red meats, right? Because you want to limit your intake of red meats. And another other quarter of your plate, you should dedicate to whole grain foods. What are whole grains? These are things like um, whole wheats, barley, quinoa, oats and foods made from whole grains like whole wheat pasta and when it comes to drinks you should always make um, your drink of choice water and if you drink juice we prefer that you uh, limit it to a small glass because usually juices tend to have lots of sugars and sugars are number one killer so you want to avoid sugar and when it comes to milk and dairy products you also want to limit that to just to one to two servings a day. So a healthy diet, what do we mean by a healthy diet? And we, when we talk about this, I want us to think of it as a lifestyle, not as a diet, because this really is, um, you, you need to be proactive when it comes to this area. And there's so much change that we need to make. For example, moderate calorie intake. What do we mean by this? So we all know how much calories, or we have an idea of how much calories we incorporate into our bodies. So moderate calorie intake is about reducing that average caloric intake without, malnour without malnourishment or without um, uh, minimizing the proper nutrients and vitamins that we receive. So just minimizing it above your, um, uh, just below a, your average caloric intake. And you want to increase omega-3 fatty acids. So omega-3 fatty acids are your essential fats. Your body can't make these essential fats, these omega-3 fatty acids from scratch. So we, it has to get them from foods. So some examples are fish vegetable oils, nuts, especially walnuts. Walnuts are a wonderful source of omega-3 fatty acids. Flax seeds, flaxseed oil, and leafy vegetables. Those are very good sources of omega-3 fatty acids. Increase antioxidants. 
What are antioxidants? So all around us in the environment, there are free radicals. And these free radicals are like unstable or very bad molecules that can damage our cells. So when we eat antioxidants, we are protecting our cells. And I'll give you on the next slide, top 20 antioxidants straight from the USDA that you should be incorporating in your daily diet. And glycemic index. So glycemic index is a scale uh, where it rates carbohydrate, in, uh, carbohydrate including food. And you wanna aim for low glycemic index because this has um, low impact on your blood sugar levels. So when it comes to low glycemic index, this is pretty much everything that we discussed fruits, vegetables, beans, minimally processed grains, minimally processed pasta, low-fat dairy foods, and nuts. Just to give you an idea what high glycemic index is, just so you know what to avoid, high glycemic index are things like packaged cereals, rice cakes, cakes, donuts, croissants, white bread, um, all the delicious things that we tend to go for those are not good for us because they have bad effect on our blood sugar levels. So when we look at foods, we want them to be on this low glycemic index. So for example, when we eat rice, we wanna aim for brown rice instead of white rice. So when it comes to antioxidants, so the USDA, they took hundreds of foods and they analyzed it based on their antioxidant capacity per serving. And this is what they found, that these foods have the highest source of antioxidants. And these are not necessarily foods that you should be eating every single day, but this is uh, just a list of things that we should be more mindful of in including it in our diets. Things like red beans, blueberries, red kidney beans, pinto beans, blueberries, cranberries, artichokes, blackberries, prunes, raspberries, strawberries, red delicious apples, very specific, right? Granny Smith, you get the idea. And you can find this list with a very simple Google search. All you have to do is top 20 antioxidant foods and you'll get access to this list. So this gives us some ideas of what we should be eating. So when it comes to diet for brain health, there's a lot of evidence, there's a lot of research on the Mediterranean diet. And this is recognized by the World Health Organization as a very healthy and sustainable dietary pattern. And there's a lot of research that maybe this diet may reduce risk of cognitive decline. And the main components of this diet is everything that we discussed. This is daily consumption of vegetables and fruits, right? No negotiations, uh, no, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, so daily intake of fruits and vegetables, whole grains and healthy fats. Also weekly intake of fish, poultry, beans, and eggs, weekly. So not daily, but weekly. And we're not nutritionists. So um, uh, the, our knowledge here is um, limited in this area. We know what the research tells us, but if you have specific dietary uh, restrictions, it's always important to talk to your physical um, primary uh, physician to see what you should be eating, what you should be avoiding because we're all different and we all have different health conditions that we should be mindful of. And uh, moderate portions of dairy products and limited intake of red meat. So let me just see how we are doing on time. Okay, great. Do we have any questions or anything that we should clarify and discuss? So if anything does come up, please write it in the chat box. Okay, so this wonderful visual my uh, colleague Melissa Clave developed, and uh, this is very interesting because it shows us what servings are. So when you take a look at your hand, right, you should look at your hand um, as a visual. So when you clench your fist, this is about one cup or a serving of leafy vegetables or leafy greens. So when you look at your fist, this is how much of a serving um, you should have. So your thumb is about two tablespoons or one serving of peanut butter. The tip of your index finger is roughly equal to one teaspoon or a portion of fat. Then you have your palm, 
which is the size or serving of a meat, about three to four ounces. So let's switch gears and talk about physical activity because this is also an important area that most of us um, have room for improvement. Um, so how much physical activity are we getting? So less than um, a quarter of older adults hit the recommended physical activity level. So um, when we think of physical activity, this is everything that gets us moving, everything uh, that's recreational or leisurely activities, right? This can also be activities like household chores, anything that gets you moving, anything that gets your heart rate up, that gets your blood pumping, those are all good signs of physical activity. But this is one of the most important things that adults can do for their health. And Physical activity is recommended no matter your age, no matter your condition. We all have room for improvement in this area. So what does the research show us? The research shows that physical, physically active people seem less likely to develop cognitive decline, all-cause dementia, vascular dementia, Alzheimer's disease, when compared to um, non-active people. Um, this is especially true for the highest level of physical activity, like moderate or vigorous uh, aerobic activity. Physical activity may also reduce risk of diabetes, may reduce risk of heart disease, depression, stroke. It may also enhance immune system and functions, prevent falls, improve uh, cognition, improve brain cell connections, improve memory. And we know what's good for your heart is good for your brain. So physical activity is something that we can all incorporate at least 30 minutes of physical activity a day. So what does the World Health Organization recommend? They recommend 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity throughout the week. That's a mouthful. But 150 minutes is roughly 30 minutes a day. And if you can't do 30 minutes a day, do 15 minutes twice a day, right? This is an area that's very, very important. What does moderate, what does vigorous mean? So moderate is when you can talk but not sing. Vigorous with when you can only talk in short phrases. So just an idea. So you know what moderate and vigorous is. But anything that you can do to get moving, you can even do uh, chair yoga. You can do exercises in your chair if you don't have the ability to get up and move, if you have physical limitations. Any sort of movement that you can do, anything that you can do to get your heart rate up, get your blood pumping, it's good for your heart, it's good for your brain. These are things like brisk walking, right? Walking around the neighborhood, maybe once a day, twice a day, like walking, cycling, um, maybe even swimming, if that's something that you do, playing tennis, playing sports. Also, do what you enjoy, because research says if you are enjoying what you're doing, that's also good for your brain. This shouldn't really be a punishment. This really shouldn't be something unpleasant. So it should be something that you actually enjoy and look forward to. So sort of evaluate, check in and see what are some of the physical activities that I enjoy doing. For example, running is very unpleasant for me, so I'm not going to run. But I do know that there are other things that I can do to get my heart rate up. So maybe I can go on a treadmill or the elliptical, or I can go play tennis, or I can swim, right? But every time you start a new program, you always want to check in with your primary care physician, especially if you haven't been active for a long time and you want to start a new vigorous program. It's important to check to see if this is right for you because it might not be right for everyone. And it's all about small steps, small steps that lead to healthier goals. Okay, let's talk about cognitive stimulation and cognitive exercises. There's this concept called the cognitive reserve, which researchers say that it might be a protective factor. Cognitive reserve is kind of like resiliency for your brain. This refers to the brain's ability to cope with or compensate for neuropathology or damage. So studies show that increased cognitive um, activity or cognitive stimulation can increase cognitive reserve. 
And how do we increase our cognitive reserve? We do it by challenging our brain, by doing things that are difficult for us. And we have some ideas that we'll go over. So some mentally stimulating activities. These are just some ideas of what you can do to challenge your brain. For example, this gentleman here, he's playing chess. This is a vigorous mental workout. This is good for strategic thinking. This is good for decision making. This is good for better attention and um, improved focus. So chess is a wonderful, vigorous mental workout. And it's never too late to learn how to play chess. Other uh, mentally stimulating activities, reading books and magazines, playing games and puzzles, learning a new language, taking or teaching a class, learning to play a new mus musical instrument, joining a choir, taking up quilting, knitting, drawing, learning digital photography, taking a cooking class, working, volunteers, so many things can go on this list. And I'm curious to know, what types of mentally stimulating activities do you pursue? Let me know in the chat, uh, in the chat box below. These are just some ideas of what you can do to exercise your brain and anything that's challenging for you, anything that's new for you. For example, I really enjoy reading. So every now and then I try to read a difficult book, um, something that's going to get me thinking, something maybe philosophical or maybe something that's really going to get me um, thinking about new concepts and new ideas that's really going to challenge me in new and different ways. So Lynn says, sing with the group on Zoom, entertain on hold. Susan says, play mahjong, very good. Melissa, trying to learn sign language. That's very good, learn, reading and volunteering. Those are all amazing examples of cognitive stimulation. So let's talk about sleep and relaxation. This is another pillar of brain health. Um, this is something that we also all have room for improvement, especially during this pandemic where there's heightened levels of anxiety and stress and so much going on that we have um, not been practicing good sleep hygiene. So we have some really good information here. So did you know that there are changes to sleep as we get older? So as we get older, sleep becomes less deep and there are more awakenings. And we see this from research where um, a lot of older adults have been interviewed and they've noticed that um, about half of older adults, about 54% of older adults say that they wake up in the middle of the night and they can't go back to sleep or they wake up too early in the morning and have trouble going back to bed. So this is very common. So sleep becomes more vulnerable and um, this can be due to a variety of different factors. Maybe it's environmental factors, it can be due to medications, poor lifestyle factors, um, also maybe underlying health conditions that can also contribute to poor sleep. The good news is that people at any age can practice and improve their sleep patterns. So sleep is essential to overall mental and physical health and well-being. Um, sleep promotes cognitive function and allows the brain to create new brain cell connections. So when you are sleeping, you are actually clearing your brain of toxins. You are clearing your brain of beta amyloid. And this is crucial because beta amyloid is the naturally occurring protein that is contributing to the development of Alzheimer's disease. So when you sleep, you are clearing your brain. You know, just by sleeping, you can do that. And it's amazing because when you sleep, you know, your brain is, uh, this is the consolidation process. This is where everything you did during the day um, is kind of being reprogrammed during sleep. And this is especially important for memory improvement as well, because when you go to sleep, it's like a computer hitting the save button. So if you want better memory, uh, improvement in memory, you have to make sure to practice good sleep hygiene. And we will discuss what sleep hygiene looks like. REM sleep is involved in memory consolidation. REM sleep 
uh, REM sleep is rapid eye movement. So this is, for example, have you ever noticed when someone is very deep in sleep, their, their eyes kind of switch, like twitch back and forth. That is a very deep level of sleep. And usually that's the dream state of sleep. So it's very important. We sleep in different stages. So it's important to get deep quality sleep. And we'll talk a little bit about um, good night's sleep. So when it comes to good night's sleep, you wanna follow a regular sleep schedule. You wanna sleep at the same time, wake up at the same time every single day, no matter if it's weekday or no matter if it's weekend. You want to develop a bedtime routine. Maybe it's reading a good book, maybe it's meditation, maybe it's a prayer, whatever works for you. And you want to control the temperature in the room. This is important because you want to aim for a temperature of about 65 degrees. Now that's very cold. It's cool for a lot of people. And the reason why we aim for 65 degrees is because our body temperature needs to cool down for us to go to sleep and to stay asleep. So um, that's something that we can adjust. L use low lighting um, and you want to limit your exposure to lighting throughout the day, especially as it gets closer to bedtime. You want to limit your exposure to smartphones, blue light, computers, TV. And one important thing that I want you all to take away is older adults need about the same amount of sleep as young adults seven to nine hours of sleep, non-negotiable sleep every single day. Some adults say, well, I sleep about five, six hours a day and I'm fine, right? That's actually a myth. Um, older adults need seven to nine hours of sleep each night, same as young adults. And just because we get older doesn't mean we need less sleep. That's something that we can't compromise. So some things that you want to avoid you want to avoid napping in the late afternoon or evening because that can sort of create an imbalance. It can mess up your natural sleeping cycle. You want to avoid using electronic devices right before bed. You want to avoid eating large meals late. Don't consume caffeine late in the day because actually coffee has a very long um, half-life. So when you are drinking caffeine, it can be in your body, in your system, even when you're going to bed. So you want to make sure you drink your coffee very early in the morning. Um, you want to avoid alcohol. Although some people believe that having a glass of wine, it can contribute to a better night's sleep. But when you are drinking alcohol, you are actually sort of manipulating your natural sleep cycle. And there's research that shows when you are taking alcohol or certain um, sleep medications, you are actually um, skipping that deep REM sleep that's very essential. You're getting that idea that you are sleeping, um, but it's actually not that natural deep cycle of sleep that you want. So avoid alcohol if you can. Okay, let's talk about social engagement. This is very important because social engagement is crucial at any age, but this is especially important as older adults um, get older because this can be especially life affirming. So social engagement is a sign of well-being throughout all of your life. People who have meaningful relationships, meaningful activities like volunteering, they say that they feel healthier and they feel happier. And social activities are linked to reduce risk of some health problems, including dementia. This is one of those areas that unfortunately has been disturbed right now during this pandemic, but even social engagement via Zoom is something that can be very good for you. Even having a conversation with someone, there's research that shows if you are conversing with someone, it doesn't matter if you're the one talking or you're the one listening, different areas of your brain are actually lighting up. So there's all kinds of benefits when it comes to social engagement. Some ideas for social engagement are joining a club, volunteering, finding a part-time job, delivering meals to isolated adults. There's wonderful opportunities for that. Getting involved through a church group, making lunch, lunch plans, meeting up with friends. You can also uh, research different um, programs like Area Agency of Aging, your local senior center, your local programs and community organizations. You can even come and volunteer for Alzheimer's Orange County. We have wonderful volunteer opportunities. 
So let's check how we are doing on time. Okay, so we might be picking up our pace a little bit. I wanna make sure we have enough time for questions. So there's medical conditions that adults experience that it's very important to manage because it can contribute um, to cognitive decline. So these are things like weight management, um, obesity, even underweight, those are things that can contribute to problems later in life, hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and depression. Those are all conditions that we want to be mindful. So of course, weight management, being overweight and underweight in both midlife and old age might be associated with high risk of dementia. So it's important for you to be aware of your body mass index, and you can easily calculate that. So if you do have, um, uh, if you are if, or experiencing obesity or overweight, you want to reduce your weight. And you can do that by following the Mediterranean diet and incorporating all the foods that we talked about earlier. And it's very important to reduce sedentary behavior. This is another tough one during the pandemic because we're all working from home. We're all sheltering in place. So a lot of our movement and our physical activity, unfortunately, is being cut in half. But even throughout the day, if you can get up, stretch, move around, that's good for you. You want to practice a regular physical activity as appropriate. Hypertension. Um, this is high blood pressure. So there's a lot of studies in this area that show if you do reduce hypertension, this can have many benefits in reducing cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And overall, it can improve health in the aging population. So if this is something that you are experiencing, there are things that you can do to sort of mitigate this process. You can do this by eating a healthy diet, maintaining a healthy weight, participating in physical activity. So it's interesting because all of these things work together and they all work together for your healthy heart and healthy brain and they all contribute. Um, so it's not any one thing that you can do, it's a collection of all these things. And we sort of see a pattern where it's all of these six pillars, you know, they have an influence on each other and they all work together. Diabetes, there's a lot of research in this area too that shows late life diabetes has been linked to increased risk of dementia. And diabetes is something you can talk to your primary care physician about. Depression, like we talked about, is a treatable condition that can cause changes in memory and cognition. So if you believe that you might be experiencing depressive-like symptoms, it's very important to talk to your physician about that because there are treatments that are available. So you want to manage other threats to brain health. What are those threats? Some threats to brain health that we want to avoid are tobacco use, right? Um, we don't even need to present the research in this area because we've come a long way and we know how detrimental tobacco use is for our brain and our heart. So uh, we'll briefly, briefly go over that. Alcohol use disorders, uh, sleep apnea, stress, and hearing loss. So tobacco use, of course, this has been linked to all kinds of diseases. Um, but instead of talking about why tobacco use and smoking is bad for you, let's talk about why quitting is good for you. So when you do quit, you'll see reduced health risks for many types of cancer, cardiovascular diseases, respiratory disorders. Also, quitting can reduce depression, anxiety, stress, improve mood, and quality of life. Alcohol, alcohol use disorders. This is also very common for adults. So you want to um, limit alcohol intake because of course excessive alcohol is a risk factor for dementia and cognitive decline. So talk to your doctor, see what you can do to um, seek treatment for that. Sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is insufficient blood flow, insufficient oxygen to your brain. This is a clinical disorder. This is uh, frequent pauses in breathing, uh, breathing and then um, you wake up uh, at night, usually followed by loud snoring. If this goes undiagnosed or untreated, it can have detrimental um, effects on your brain. There are CPAP machines that can help sort of um, alleviate the sleep apnea effects. Talk to your doctor. If you think you are experiencing changes in your sleep patterns, you talk to your doctor because there are treatments for that. Uh, 
chronic stress. This is important as well because we all experience stress and acute stress, small stress, that's good for us. It's a natural, normal response to psychological uh, stressors, everyday um, experiences that we have. So small stress is good for us, right? It keeps us in check. But chronic stress, right? Extended periods of prolonged stress is bad for us because it can have detrimental effects on our memory, mood, anxiety. It can cause inflammation, which is very bad for our brains. It can have it can have adverse um, effects on our overall health. So if you believe that you are experiencing stress, again, talk to your doctor, uh, share your concerns, talk about your feelings. There are treatments, there are techniques. Let's talk about healthy ways to relax and recharge. And I want to hear from some of you, what are ways that you relax and you recharge? So some ideas here are good for a walk. Go for a walk, spend time in nature, call a good friend, release tension with a good workout, write in your journal, take a long bath, light scented candles, savor a warm cup of coffee or tea, play with a pet that can be very therapeutic, work in your garden. There's something about working with your hands and earth has been proven to be very good for your brain. Get a massage, read a good book, listen to music, watch a comedy, right? The possibilities here are endless and you do what works for you. Lynn says, walk, my cat, friends on Zoom, very good. Hearing loss, this is very common for older adults. This affects one in three adults age 65 and older. And this can have some effects on memory because if you are not hearing the information, you can't encode and process the information, of course you are going to notice changes in cognition and memory. So this is something that can be treated for, and hearing aids are especially helpful treatments in this area. So if you are noticing changes in this area, you know what to do. So let's talk about small changes, big impacts. So there's room for improvement for all of us in this area. So engaging in a healthy lifestyle requires preparation and goal setting. So you want to pick one thing you can do in each area that can help you to improve your brain health. Think of small first steps that you can take. And I want you to be realistic with yourself. Right now, when you're listening to this information and you're reading all this research and you're thinking, boy, I have a long way to go. There's so much that I need to do. Don't overwhelm yourself. Just think about small things that you can do, small attainable goals every single day, whether it's eating a single piece of fruit or vegetable every day or going for a walk 30 minutes a day every day or maybe calling a friend and engaging in a conversation or intellectually stimulating discussion via Zoom. Zoom, whatever it is, um, think of small achievable goals that you can do. And when you do pick your goals, I want you to think of SMART goals. What are SMART goals? SMART goals are specific, measurable, realistic, and time, time bound. So a very broad, not SMART goal would be something like, I'm going to exercise more. That's not a SMART goal because you can't really measure it. There's no timeline on it. You don't know what your deliverables are. It's just sort of broad and it's out there and you're not likely to engage in activities that's going to pursue your goal. So some examples of SMART goals are, I will walk for 15 minutes three times per week for the next two weeks, right? It's very specific. You can measure it and you're more likely to work towards this goal and to accomplish this goal if it's very specific like that. Small changes, big impact. And it's important to write down what you will do, when you will do it, and to keep track of your progress. If you write it down on a notepad, if you write it down on your phone, you're more likely to follow through. And it's important to empower yourself, to congratulate yourself, keep going. If you mess up, if you skip a day, don't worry about it, just celebrate progress, celebrate um, your improvement. Okay, so I want you um, to note this next class that we have coming up. It's Memory Tricks and Teasers. It will be held July 8th from 1 to 2 p.m. In this class, we will specifically be talking about memory and we'll be talking about memory tricks and teasers. So we'll teach you evidence-based techniques and strategies, how to improve your memory, what you can do to remember a grocery list, what you can do to remember a to-do list, a phone number, a license plate, 
all kinds of information. And my colleague Melissa just posted the direct link on the chat box. So if you click on that link and you RSVP, it's a free class. It's a part two of this, but specifically dedicated to memory. It's very interactive, very fun. So I hope you can join us. So before we end the class, a couple things. We do have our helpline and our helpline operates. We provide all kinds of information, referrals and supports. So write down our 844 number and give us a call if any questions or concerns come up. We'd be very happy to speak with you. Connect us on Facebook. I know a lot of you are on Facebook. What I want you to do is I want you to find us facebook.com slash ALZOC. I want you to like us. I want you to comment, chat with us, tell us what you thought about this class. This way you can be engaged and find out more about what we're doing. We post all kinds of brain health news and events and all kinds of interesting information. You can also visit our website where we have Lots of interesting classes, support groups. If you know of individuals with dementia, cognitive decline, or Alzheimer's disease, we're here to help. So visit our website and find out um, who we are and what we do. I believe this was my last slide. We ended just in time. Um, if you have any questions or um, anything you'd like to discuss, you can either unmute yourself or um, you can also type it in the chat box. I think the best way would be to type it in the chat box so everyone can see. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer it. But we are all done for today. If you do have to leave. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Remember to sign up for part two, Memory Tricks and Teasers. It was a pleasure teaching you this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Roxy. And we had one question about the recording. We, we did record, and so hopefully this will be up on our website within the next week or so. We'll just do a little bit of editing, and our communications team will get that up there. We have lots of recordings on our website of past presentations. Um, they're on YouTube as well, um, but we encourage you to check those out. And thank you everyone for being here today. And look, I'm going to send you an email. Um, I put the survey link in, in the chat box, but I'm going to send you an email with um, the class rocks you mentioned and the survey link. Um, so look out for that. And thank you all again for being here. We'll stay on for a few minutes if anyone has questions. Thank you so much, Melissa.